And my name is Oliver Clayton, I'm 26 years old and I identify as a mixed race black male. My mum is from East London, where she's, her mum is from Jamaica. So her mum came over with the Rin Rush generation and then my mum was born uh, last of 10, um, seven of which were born in the UK. Grew up in and around East London. And then my dad is from Australia, so he was born in Australia uh, and then moved over to the UK when he was three. So he doesn't really consider himself Australian at all, but we've managed to finesse a passport each. Um, and they met when they were 16, 17, when my dad moved to London. And they've been together, they've been together as long as I've been alive. So, and, and, and before that, obviously. So uh, I think I've been quite fortunate and privileged with, what, with what's been afforded to me in terms of my parents being together, because I'm aware that there is a stereotype that when I've come into rooms or with other um, black people or people of mixed heritage, that there is a conception or an idea that your parents haven't haven't stayed together, um, and or that your mum is your mum's white, um, and my mum is black, and my my parents have stayed together, so. It felt at one point where I might have been not an exception to a rule because that isn't the rule, but yeah. So I, yeah, that's that's how I grew up. And I grew up in the countryside um, from four to 18. I think in, in hindsight, because I've had some distance from it, yes, I did. And I think a lot of that came from um, me not feeling like I was enough of either or. And that mostly came from um, uh, people, I don't want to put this, people projecting their idea of blackness onto myself. And this is, this is, um, this is me in rural England. Um, so it's, Major the majority of people are white, very little um, people of colour. Um, and it's changing, it's ch it is changing now, but when I was growing up, uh, it was it was me and my family, and then maybe, were the only, were the only black family that I knew of in my village. And then there was uh, a family where their kids were mixed race and they were Indian. So there was, no, there was no one about. So a lot of it was what other people thought my blackness should be. And then me going, okay, so that's how, is that how black people should be? Um, and then never actually ever being able to be white because I am raci racialized off the bat as black. I will never be seen as white. So yeah. Yeah, she did. Um, to an extent, and I say to an extent because I think my mum was also discovering more and more out about her own family herself. So I think the more that she did, and this is as we, as her children got older as well, the more that we then, as a byproduct, saw her doing it. And I know I actively took an interest in then finding more out um, about um, black culture, black food. I mean, she cooked a bang of rice and peas that was, her mum's dish passed down to her. Um, black music came through my cousins. So they introduced me to dancehall and grime. And that was that was a blessing. So, and I think having that, those are what I mean by support systems, having, having them there as a reference, um, as well as my mum, because you can't expect that one person to do everything for you. I mean, some people do, and they give you all of that, and they are fantastic. But um, I was fortunate that well, my mum wasn't necessarily because we didn't, we didn't, we weren't necessarily blaring music like Michael Jackson or um, or, or or Bill Withers or um, Marvin Gaye out in 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 our house. That just 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 wasn't how we were growing up. So having my cousins there as a reference point really helps with a lot of like introductions to um, um, the what the culture in a wider sense and to music and to food and to fashion and um, well particularly music and fashion a lot of that came through my cousins and then as we've got older my mum has always been like this this black thinker there is 
this article on this, you should probably go have a look at. Um, um, yeah. So it's kind of been, as I've grown, my mum's grown and vice versa. Um, rather than her just being like, he's everything off the bat. Because I didn't, I don't think she felt, not to say that she didn't think that was important, but that um, I think that, that was probably, yeah. Maybe she knew she was get. I was going to get it from other places. Who knows? But yeah. I think the moment for me was when, in secondary school, I was asked, "Why do you sound so white?" And it was like, "Oh, this is the penny drop moment." Because before, I suppose up until then, there wasn't anything which had made us like made me majorly aware of differences that I was able to go oh this is me being exotified or being um fetishized um for example like like with the questions later my hair for example and people touching my hair and asking um when I had an afro in year eight and people being like oh this is can I can I touch this I didn't realize that was um I thought that was just something which was made me cool and in being included in the group rather than oh, this is this is this is um this is being seen as something different therefore it's exciting therefore i need to um interact with it in some some sort of way i think it was that why do you sound so white meaning oh there, there is a difference this is this is this is confirmed now and there's no way from really going back from that Not uh, as such. I know that things have come up purely because of what has been going on um, recently. And that is also coupled with the fact that me and my younger brother are now old enough to be able to feel comfortable to be able to speak to both my parents about this. Um, I've always felt comfortable speaking about race with my mum. My dad is slightly different because he's, he's white. Um, so we've never really broached those subjects until now. So I'd say, I suppose, by byproduct of discussion, and there are things that maybe have to be teaching moments or um, something which he might not get right away or feel under threat because he feels like it's an attack on him and it's not an attack on him. It's just we're having a conversation where there might be conflict, but not in not in like a typical sense. Like there's like a fissure in the family because my dad says something or, or a family member says something. I know that my that there's a story about my dad's mum saying that she lost her wedding invite to the my parents' wedding or that she wasn't invited when they know full well that she was. But that's like the only thing. I can really think of. I would say that mostly what I experienced growing up was uh, probably more indirect racism. Um, we're talking about microaggressions and racism born of ignorance and people just because nobody's challenged necessarily. Um, we're so when we're not experienced, I didn't experience like overt what you might call American racism of people being like you oh you, you mixed race or nothing like nothing there's, there's none of that it was probably more um oh look I'm almost as dark as you now oh shit your cornrows they're smarter than I thought they would be um oh and then I think my brother yeah um through through rugby he played a lot of rugby he still plays a lot of rugby um, like indirect, yeah, a lot of indirect racism. So we were in a pub, for example, when I was visiting home um, a couple of years ago and uh, some old school friends, then boyfriend was like, yeah, man, I love black music, love black culture. You guys are just so cool. I wish I was black, you know, because you just dress cooler and it's, it's that type of shit. It's not, um, it's not the overt stuff. Yeah, so more indirect. Secondary school was probably, and again with hindsight and having distance from it, the most problematic time. Primary school was, uh, for the most part, very chill. I think there was nothing 
to make me as a kid go, oh, this is this is racism. Oh, this is someone making me feel some type of way. Um, pardon me. Oh, this is um, this is what a microaggression is. It was from what I can remember, um, just a very 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 calm, very decent experience. And my mum had specifically chosen that primary school because she'd seen that one they had one like one black boy in, in in the rest of the school, but also because they had pictures, they did a lot of charity work, it was a Catholic school. And so they had pictures of Africa, which was better than the other school in the area, which had the, no no exposure of any of any kind. So anything that was not white um on the walls essentially. Um secondary school was uh where the, yeah, I think things are starting to get realised like more of the other well more of other people's ideas about blackness again predominantly white area there were I think when I was in year nine there were four people of colour two mixed race boys including myself Amisu uh, who's of Nigerian origin and then Aisha Bhatia who was like um I want to say Indian or Pakistani origin and if I'm Aisha if I'm butchering that forgive me but like um you so you didn't really have a support this was our support system and you didn't have a support system in terms of staff because there's no people of color on staff there are no black people on staff there are asian people on staff um in 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 senior positions or otherwise like i don't even we didn't even have um uh people of color in in what might be considered menial roles in school so there was no one to talk to about things that came up like um, these microaggressions or um, or racist or racist comments born of ignorance. Um, so a lot of the time, like I said before, our scope of who we could be was framed in other people's ideas of blackness. Um, so I think to fit in, we'd probably be like okay we can be this side we will be the black kids um which uh which then made us like have our this was that and that was our role within our school ecosystem i suppose um and i think towards year 11 especially i started to try and hang around um george and I mean, it was george is the other mixed race boy george and amici more because it i think it just made probably subconsciously made us feel more comfortable because we had each other um but yeah school secondary school was probably the most problematic and then uni was again um like primary school but for different reasons pretty chill because it was again i had distance from secondary school i'd already I had a foundation year and then a year out so i, I knew who I, I was starting to feel like I was finding my what blackness was for me, um, what my mixed race identity was for me, um, and I could explore that more in this environment, which was, it, I'm not saying it was perfect, but it was encouraging it. And the fact that we've already had talks given like with everything that's happened with my uni about um, decolonizing, the um, uh, the acting courses curriculum, um, making sure that there is um, things in place for future um, students of color in, to be able to report through correct channels, racism or any type of bigotism. Um, staff have got um, uh, uh, do it on awareness training, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The that was a much more um, conducive environment to me uh, developing as a person and find it and being allowed to find who I am and um, like I said before, what blackness meant to me. So yeah, uni was was great, and I, yeah, double down on secondary school probably being the most problematic for me. In year eight, I had. Um, growing out my hair into an afro, so I was going to school, and um, people were, I was, people were putting their, the contents of their pencil case in my hair, 
but I would play along with this because I was like, oh, this this is this is this is cool. People were paying me attention. Um, I flirted around a lot in school, um, all the way through school. So to have um, people take interest, well, what I thought was in me rather than, but it was actually my hair because it was different and no one had ever seen this before. And um, was, was the, yeah, that was, that was, and being like, oh, I can, how many, how many pencils can we fit in Lolly's hair today? Um, or then when I had it braided, um, like one of the only times I've had my hair braided in the cornrows and having to call the school up beforehand to be like, is it okay if he comes in in braids? Well, of course it's okay if he comes in in braids because there's nothing um, offensive about the hair, that hairstyle on a 12 year old boy. There's, there should be nothing threatening about that. But the fact that you have to call the school up beforehand, um, say, is this okay? And then coming into school and my and the head of year going, they actually, they actually, they actually look smart. So they actually, they actually, they, they pass, they pass the eye test. Um, this is, this is, this is acceptable. Well, I suppose the school thing, the cornrows thing is, 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 is like thinking about it now is, is a probably an example of systemic racism because the, um, the standard is a white standard, um, which comes from um, a history of colonialism and a repression of blackness. And so, yeah, um, that, so probably within secondary school and stuff like that. I think my brother has experienced it more with rugby as in that he has directly experienced it more with rugby because um, he was talking about it the other day. And it's the it's a similar thing with American football. Um, we saw recently that Lamar Jackson rose to prominence, and everyone was going, "You can't have a black quarterback because um, because we just don't have black quarterbacks." And and why is it we, we don't have black quarterbacks? Is because the 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 raw the, all those all those um, adjectives associated, or, or, which is now racist language, quote or commentary, like this power and it's raw, raw ability and it's just power, pace and power and, and, and it's an athletic prowess, which is always associated, always associated with black athletes. I mean, you see footballers, pace and power is, a, is, 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 the, is the phrase most commonly used when referring to um, black footballers. And it's never, oh, intelligent, uh, dynamic. Um, um, a great pass with the ball. It's always pace and power. So, th and this this happens in rugby as well. So you have uh, he was never he was always seen as a winger, a cent or a centre or or, posi or put in positions which were associated with having pace and power. And no one ever thought that you could be intelligent enough or learn the game fast enough to be able to play those positions, which meant that you. Or, or were seen as field generals, or, or, or having the or being able to um, command a command your team, or um, in a, in a, being in a leadership role. Um, so scrum halves, fly halves, and you never see any black scrum halves and fly halves because coaches do not believe or have this idea that you 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 have a black. A, a black child they might progress faster they might be, they, because they're athletically gifted or the or the, the stereotype is that we are athletically gifted um uh, and then and then siphon them off to these other positions so you never you never the, there is never the chance to to blossom in in that in that role because you're not seen in the leadership role and um, because you're not seen as to be intelligent enough to be in that role so so he so he so yeah I think my brother has definitely experienced it a lot more through his experience with rugby than I have in regards to systemic racism. Um, I can't experience colorism because I have light skin privilege. Um, colorism is a problem within black culture, but I cannot experience it because I have light skin privilege. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't, um, yeah, it wouldn't affect me. Much, much, much less now. In fact, hardly ever now. Um, but it used to be, can I touch your hair? Why do you sound so white? And that, yeah, that was it. That was those are the big things. And now, um, I, yeah, 
I'm very fortunate to have people around me, even even in predominantly white spaces, that aren't being idiots. So yeah. Yeah, I think they do. Um, I think it would be a lot harder for me growing up in the countryside, or I think a lot harder in general anyway. If you were, if you're a woman of color, so if you're a, and then if you're a mixed woman of color, it's 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 more. It would be. I think it's personally for me. I think it brings a different set of challenges, and I think it's more difficult because you are then. Audrey Lord talks about being. Le the levels of oppression and if you're so if you're black yes and then you're for working class yes and then if you are a person of color yes so, and so that's like i am doubly oppressed i almost i am aware that i also have the privilege of being light-skinned i am um not i'm not seen as as threatening if i was a girl i would be i think i would have been fascist fetishized because and um, and exotified so much more than I have been. I think um, there would have been pressures, especially like I know was, there's there's those things surrounding my hair. I can only imagine in my scenario, if I didn't have black people around me, and I was a mixed race girl, then the the pressures to 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 fit in, um, uh, standards of Eurocentric beauty. Um, and to meet and to meet those if if um and again i'm speaking of if i was growing up at my uh at the time i was growing up in my situation um i think it would have been it would have been it would have been much harder um and there would have been more things that i was battling with so i do yeah i do think uh that black uh well mixed race men and women had different experiences and i would say but then again, but it, again it depends on it depends on where you are if i was a mixed race woman living in london and i was around and i could see other black faces and i had reference points and there were people to uh help me identify with the culture and and immediately off the bat understand that i would be racialized as black um that i did have a privilege of being light-skinned um but I had this base within the community, then it would be very different to say, um, I don't know, Sally from Scotland, whose who's dad and mum might live up in Edinburgh, but then she feels like she might have to straighten her hair because everybody else around her is white, because it, we know that Scotland is very, 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 oh my God, very, very white. Uh, and there's nobody else to have as a reference point. And maybe you have the internet, but, how how much does that actually get you, especially when you're six and someone goes, well, oh, can I touch your hair? Oh my God, it feels like a sheep. Does she go back to my mum or dad to say that? Does, does that bring it up? Does my mum feel comfortable doing that in the area she's in? I have never been stopped by the police. I'm aware that I'm not um, deemed as as threatening. As soon as I open my mouth, for one, I'm not, um, uh, I might be seen as acceptably black by white people, or I'm less threatening because, um, purely, yeah, because of the color of my skin, because of the way I speak, because um, I look slightly more in line with Eurocentric ideals about beauty and standards of beauty. Um, so it, allow, it means that I'm probably allowed into spaces or allowed to navigate through spaces. No, for sure, I am allowed to enter spaces and navigate through spaces with much more ease. And I don't have to think about being checked or someone looking at me a certain way, obviously, maybe, or there would still be, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It will be difficult at times um expect people to make immediate assumptions of you um that you will you will be fetishized um expect to be racialized as black 
but also I don't want to sound make it. It's not all negative. Like there isn't. There is. It's not all negative. Um, I'm not the same. Yeah. Expect growing up. Yeah. Expect it to be difficult, but um, expect that at some point you will find the support system and um, people around you to help. And yeah, I know it's not what to expect, but yeah, you're enough and your blackness is enough. It's for you.